Can everyone hear me? Oh wow, everyone got quiet so quickly. Good morning, everyone. This is our Sunday service, but technically this is our last session of retreat. So thank you for being here. Um, I, I feel bad for saying this every time, but could you please scoot up? The, the front row is very free right now. So um, if you are in the second row, move up to the first row. If you're in the third row, move up to the second row. No, no one's gonna move. All right, cool. As long as you obey the Lord and not me, that's I'm for that. I'm for that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I know it's been a long weekend, but I hope it's been a good one. Um, but yeah, I just want to welcome you all here. Um, yeah, before we begin our service, uh, we're gonna start. Actually, we're starting our service now. Um, my mind is everywhere, but. Uh, as we start our service, we're going to begin with the call to worship, so I'll bring up our sister, Janelle. Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you guys have been um, enjoying the past two days of retreat. I'm so glad for everyone who's joining us this morning. Um, I'm Janelle, one of the members here at Good Stewards, and I'll be sharing our call to worship. And what this is, is um, it's a time for us to prepare our hearts to worship our God as we reflect on the truth of Scripture. So if you would read along with me, um, our call to worship this morning will be coming from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9-10. through 10. And I'll read that for us. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. As it says, we were once not God's people, but now we are God's people. We have not deserved mercy, but we have received mercy. Um, let's make this truth fresh on our hearts this morning, that we are all undeserving of God's mercy. We were deserving of God's wrath and righteous judgment, but instead of getting what we deserved for our sins, God has shown us mercy and even calls us his own. Um, let's reflect on God's mercy for us and allow that to stir our hearts to rejoice and to sing praises of how great our God is. So at this time, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we uh, sing worship, songs of worship to our God this morning.
tells me of the get within a word I look and see in there who made an end for my sin because a sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the justice satisfied to look on it spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one in himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is here with Christ on high my Savior and my God. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the justice satisfied to look on Him. Before the cross of Christ and marvel at his love divine, God's perfect Son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. This river steps I cannot know, but I can glory. In its flood, the Lord Most High has bowed down low and poured on me His glorious love, and poured on me His glorious love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ who has allowed us to approach and draw near your throne. God, we thank you for a Savior who can sympathize with us, Lord, who can understand and knows all of our burdens. Lord, you know. You know all that we go through. You know all that we struggle through. And you are with us for all our lives. So, God, we entrust ourselves to you. We go to you. Lord, we need you. Do not leave us. Do not be far from us, God. We pray that as we continue to sing songs of worship to you, would you be worshiped greatly in our hearts? Would we not sing these lyrics out of habit or memory? But Lord, would we sing it out of a delight and a joy that we have in you? We commit ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer and oh a peace we often forget no what needless pain we bear all because we do not care everything to God in prayer and have we trials and temptations their trouble anywhere Jesus Savior is 
This last song that we'll be singing um, is called Holy Spirit. And the first two lines go like this. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let the presence of the risen Lord come renew my heart and make me whole. Let's be mindful of the lyrics that we're singing. And um, let's sing it as a petition and a request to God. Um, that he would breathe new life into our soul and that he would renew our heart and make us whole. So let's sing this song together now. Breathe new life 
to my wailing soul let the presence of the risen lord come renew my heart and make me whole cause your word to come alive in me give me faith for what i cannot see give me passion for your purity holy spirit breathe new life in me holy spirit come abide within may your joy seen in all I do love enough to cover every sin in each thought and deed and attitude kindness to the greatest and the least gentleness that sows the path of peace turn my strivings into works of grace breath of god show christ in all i do holy spirit come creation's birth giving life all that God has made show your power once again on earth cause your church to hunger for your ways let the fragrance of our prayers arise lead us on the road of sad that in unity the choice of Christ may be clear for all the world to see Holy Spirit living breath of God breathe new life into my wailing soul And Lord, come renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your glory. Sing, 
that verse one last time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All right, everyone, you may be seated. And as we get seated, let's thank Ian for leading us in that time of singing. Let's give him a clap. Man, it's, yeah, I got chills just hearing everyone singing together, and that was awesome. And um, as we continue our service, I hope we can continue to worship our God joyfully together. Um, my name is Austin, and I'm a, I'm a member here at Good Stewards. And before we get started with any of the announcements, um, I know no one listened to me before service started when I asked you guys to move up, but I will ask you guys to graciously listen to me this time around where I'm going to ask you to greet your neighbors and just say hi, ask how they're doing, welcome them to church, and then I'll bring us back for the announcements. All right, I'm going to cut your greeting short and ask you graciously to pay attention again. Yeah, I don't know if it's because of retreat, but it seems like everyone is more energized this morning, so praise God for that. Um, yeah, before we get into announcements, I just wanted to welcome everyone from the people tuning in from the live stream to you all who are here in person, and especially if you're a newcomer here. And if you're a newcomer and you're not just checking out this church or just visiting, um, but you are Actually, if you're not just visiting, but you are checking out our church and you want to learn more about what, we're, what we do, um, please consider filling out a newcomer form. And if you have any questions about that, please come to me after service. And also, a great way to meet more of our church members and the people who've been coming to our church for longer than you have is to stick around afterwards um, for a time of hanging out and just talking to one another after service outside the gym right behind me. Yeah, sorry. I, my mind is just like all over the place, so bear with me. Um, our vision statement as a church is to disciple the family of God through the glory of God. No, disciple the family of God through the word of God for the glory of God. Um, amen. I'm going to say it one more time because I might have distracted you guys. Discipling the family of God through the word of God for the glory of God. And simply put, God is worthy of our hearts, and so we seek to give him glory in all that we do. And we learned so much about that this weekend. And we'll be closing out our retreat with a sermon from our guest preacher, Pastor Sam, today. Um, but if you've noticed, uh, we do the same things every week. We have a call to worship. We sing songs together. We receive preaching. But all these things that we do, it's to further this vision, to give glory to God. And so hopefully you can see that um, as we go through the service together today. Now, into our ministry opportunities. The first announcement for today is we have a members meeting today from 1 to 3 p.m. in this gym. 
Um, normally, this is a closed meeting to just installed members, but this is open to non-members as well. So if you've attended retreat and you want to further your convictions or learn more about what our church does together, or even in how we further this vision together as a church, please come out. Um, it's not even an encouragement. Like, I want to say highly encouraged, but yeah, I want to more than highly encourage you all to come out. Um, and it might seem exclusive at first. What's the point of installed membership? But the hope is that everyone who comes to our church actually is added to our membership. Um, it's a way for us as a church and for you as someone who's committing to a church to publicly, seriously, and most importantly, joyfully uh, commit to serving one another for the purpose of furthering our vision statement. So please come out to that. That'll be today from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, yeah, I, I expect the same attendance, so excited to see you all there. Um, the next announcement is regarding baptism interest meeting, and that will be next Sunday, August 15th from 1 to 1.30 p.m. in the pastor's office upstairs by the upper chapel. Um, if you have no idea where that is, that's okay. This will be announced again next week, I believe, so uh, pay attention to the announcement next week. If you're curious about what baptism is or what our church believes about baptism, I'm not going to say much because I want you to go to this meeting. So, um, yeah, please come out to that if you're interested at all. By the way, um, if you're not sure if you want to be baptized or you just want to learn more about learn what it is, um, come out to the interest meeting. It doesn't mean that just because you go to the first one, you're committing to being baptized. So please go out to that. The next announcement is regarding women in the word, and this is more of a save the date. Um, this is on Saturday, August 21st at 10 a.m. in the cafe. And again, as the title suggests, it's for women only. So sorry, brothers, this is only for the sisters. And it's a, fellow, uh, it's a time of fellowshipping over reading scripture and doing devotionals together. Um, it's a simple time, but it's a sweet time. And again, uh, it's a way we can disciple one another as a church. The next couple meetings are very exciting. So the next, me uh, <laughs> next announcement, next couple announcements are very exciting. I hope my mistakes keep you paying attention. That's, it's intentional. It's intentional. Um, the next announcement is regarding Friday, na Friday night prayer. And that is this Friday at 8 p.m., but normally we've been doing it on Zoom because of the pandemic, but this will actually be the first in-person prayer meeting of, yeah. yeah, give it up, give it up, of 2021 and over a year and a half since like last March or something. So this is the very first in-person prayer meeting. Um, so please come out to that. It's been such a sweet time on Zoom, but it can be even sweeter, I believe, in person. So please come out to that Friday at 8 p.m in person and an announcement will go out on Facebook um, so regarding the place and a reminder for that so please keep your eyes peeled out for that. The next announcement is regarding Friday night Bible study and this is also a very exciting announcement. So along the vein of meeting in person starting September 3rd at 8 p.m. we're bringing back Friday night Bible study and that'll be in person so yeah can we get a clap for that as well. Yeah, and what's amazing is, if you think about it, we haven't met like this in over a year and a half. And uh, last week we had a service um, celebrating God's faithfulness over our church. And so if it doesn't seem like a big deal, it is because we've grown together as a church, even when we haven't been able to meet in person. But hopefully this spurs us on to be, want to meet in person. So hopefully um, we're looking forward to seeing you all there in, at these things. The last announcement for today is regarding weekly offering. And uh, we want to continue our worship service by giving financially. And um, this is a way for us to say, what we have, God, is not ours, but everything that you've given to us is yours already. And we give in hope and faith that God will use the finances that we give to the church to, again, furthering the vision of um, giving himself glory. So with all that, I'm going to bring up our brother and pastor, Kalen. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Hope you guys got some rest uh, from that long weekend. Before I introduce our guest speaker for today, I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of people. Um, I believe we, we, what was that game called? Is it Kahoot or Cahoots? I, I can't. Kahoot. Thank you. 
Uh, we played a game of Kahoot on Friday night, and there was a group that didn't get prizes, right? Am I, am I right? Yes. Yeah, right? Yeah, Four Seasons. If you're part of Four Seasons, I just, I just dug up my library and, and found some books for you guys. And so, can you just send a representative from Four Seasons? I don't know. Anyone come up? Come up, Charity. Let's give it up for Four Seasons. Is it five? Five people? Okay. Great, awesome. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to our, our planning team. I know they didn't get the kind of credit that they deserve for uh, just helping us to kind of go through the retreat with the scheduling and all the logistical details. So um, if you are a part of the planning team, I want to ask you to stand. I know you guys would rather just stay seated and, you know, just keep your treasure in heaven. But let, let, me, let me give you a little bit of treasure here. So let's all, you know, if, you are, if you're a part of the planning team, stand up. We want to recognize you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, thanks to you guys, we, we got to spend just a weekend in the Word and in prayer and in just a sweet fellowship together. So uh, we praise God for you guys. Um, well, without further ado, we do want to bring up our guest speaker, and I have the privilege of introducing him once again. And um, for some of you guys, this will be a repeat, but, but uh, for those of you who weren't able to make it to the retreat, um, I just wanted to introduce you to him. His name is Sam Bay. Uh, he's currently serving as one of the pastors at GLMC. Uh, they've been meeting in Buena Park, I believe. And uh, he's been there for eight years. His role has shifted over the years, of course, but uh, I, I do, I'm confident that they're just so blessed to have a brother like this they're serving. So, um, yeah, so he's serving at GLMC. Uh, he's married to his wonderful wife, Angela. And, um, yeah, like we... You know, my wife and I have been just really good friends with them. We meet up probably like, I don't know, like every month or something. <laughs> so dear, dear friends of ours, um, you know, Sam and I go way back. There's no picture to show that. I'm sorry about that. There's no pictures to show at all. So um, sorry about that. But, you know, we met in 2007 as freshmen in college, and we've kept a close friendship since then. Uh, part of the same campus ministry, same major, which, again, it was a mistake, right? We'd go to class and just just G-chat all day long <laughs> and, <then, laughs> and spend many nights just writing papers together. Yeah, back in the day, it was G-chat, guys. Yeah, G-chat was where, where it was at. Um, and then we went to seminary together at Talbot, and that was a good time of just uh, uh, being equipped together. And just to see how God has led us this far, it was just such a, bl uh, a blessing for the both of us. Uh, I mentioned this, but we stood at each other's weddings. And so when I got married here in uh, two and a half years ago, he stood by my side as uh, one of the witnesses and as one of my groomsmen. I forgot to mention this part, but we were roommates for three years, too. Uh, he lived with me, and we lived together in, for about three years, and, um, you know, that means he's seen so much of me, right? All of my laziness, my just, you know, all the filth, and <laughs> he still loves me to this day, and uh, I, I think I owe just a friendship to him and a love back to him, so... Uh, as you can tell, he's a dear, dear brother and a friend of mine, and he's a gifted preacher. I know that a lot of you guys are just blessed by his preaching, and, you know, my wife and I were just up last night until like two or three, actually, just talking about the sermon, and, you know, one of the commitments, commitments that we came up with was, you know, our life is short, let's, let's love Jesus with all of our lives, and, you know, when we die, let's die for Jesus, and so uh, super grateful for just your ministry, Sam. We want to bring him up, actually, and just uh, pray for him and his family. So can we just give a round of applause as we bring up <laughs> Pastor Sam? Yeah. We want to take time to pray for this brother and their family um, before, you know, he preaches and we send him off. He's, you know, their service starts at 11, which means he's not able to join their church. And, and he's spending his Sunday, the Lord's Day, uh, with us. And we're just so grateful. But... Yeah, Sam, if you could just kind of share with us some ways that we could be praying for you and your family. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. If I didn't get to meet you yet, nice to meet you. Yeah, my family is here. Uh, obviously, we have a young son, Ezra, eight months old, so he might be coming in and out. But if you could just pray for just two things. Uh, first, pray for us as a family, obviously. Uh, Ezra is a pandemic baby. <laughs> he was born in the smack in the middle of covid so just pray that we can continue to be a family that grows in love and godliness, that we'd be able to prioritize not only parenting, but to raise Ezra, but also for me as a 
husband that I can be able to balance the ministry and marriage well. That's always a challenge. And so to prioritize correctly the various roles that I do and to be faithful in all of them so we could pray for that. And then second, pray for our church. Uh, as with any church, I think coming out of COVID, there's just unique challenges that come with trying to get everyone back together and trying to rebuild. And so my heart goes out to everyone here, especially the volunteers. I know it's not easy. I know this is a season where the church is really uh, having a harder time getting people to really rally together because I think a lot of us have a lot of rust, spiritually speaking, that we've kind of developed through COVID. So pray for our church. Uh, I know our church in particular in the next six months, there's a lot of things happening. If you didn't know at JLMC, we're p- pretty much replanting as a church in a lot of different ways. So if you could just pray for our pastoral staff that we can be just wise and discerning and just have the strength and energy to just be faithful to the work that God's doing at our church. So, yeah. Yeah, well, we can be praying for them. Uh, please keep them in mind. And uh, just a fun fact, their church is actually going through Nehemiah as well. And uh, if you didn't know, that's going to be our next series. So uh, the, both of our churches are just in a rebuilding mode, and uh, we are just glad to be in, in prayer together in partnership. So uh, church, let's bow our heads, and uh, if you would, reach out your hand as well. And let's take some time to pray for Pastor Sam, Angela, Ezra, as well as uh, GLMC and the staff. Um, and I'll close that time in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we can worship you this day together in this way, and we're thankful that we're joined uh, by our brother uh, Sam and our sister Angela, Ezra, as well as our our brother Daniel as well, and we pray uh, at this time for their family. Uh, Lord, even as they're raising Ezra, uh, the ball of joy that he is, we pray that Sam and Angela would uh, continually commit themselves to you, that they could raise uh, Ezra uh, in the faith and Uh, in the way that pleases you, God. We pray for Ezra's salvation, uh, Lord, that even through their parenting that you would uh, raise him up as your child. So we pray for their family and wisdom in that and strength. We pray for JLMC. Uh, We love the church. Many of us might not know the church, but we love the church because they are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we lift them up in prayer. Uh, We pray that even as they're going through this rebuilding mode along with us, that you would provide wisdom, uh, especially just kind of in a a church planting mode here. We pray for for their leaders, uh, for their members, uh, for everyone involved, God, that you would equip them with love and wisdom and all that they need to glorify you through this season. And so we just pray for your grace over this church, and uh, we pray uh, even for our time here remaining, uh, that you would use the word, uh, the preaching of the word, Uh, God, to to build us up today. So, God, we thank you so much for just this friendship that we got to build with Pastor Sam. And uh, we commit, once again, his family, his church, his ministry to you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give him a round of applause one more time as he gets ready. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Again, uh, our church says hello. Uh, Our staff, we uh, have been praying And uh, again, just to reintroduce uh, the brother that's with me, Daniel Shim, he's part of our staff as well, and he does our college ministry, he helps with our Sunday operations, and so I know we've been blessed just to be able to enjoy and share this weekend with you guys on this retreat. I know uh, meeting at your church doesn't all all the time feel like a retreat, but I also know you guys ate ramen last night, so it's all good. You guys had a retreat, (laughs) that's all you really need. Uh, And it's an honor and joy to join you in worship today, and uh, it's always a privilege to share God's word. Uh, For those who did join yesterday, good to see you again, but I see some new faces that I wasn't able to meet. Nice to meet you again. My name is Sam, 
And again, I want to thank uh, everyone before getting into the text for today for being so welcoming and letting us join for this retreat. Again, I've heard a lot about Good Stewards. I've prayed for this ministry. Obviously, very good friends with Pastor Kay and with Lois. But to be here in the flesh, like it just validated everything I felt, <laughs> everything I, I presumed about this ministry. And so I would say you're in very good hands. And I do think that God is doing very amazing things through this church and through this ministry. And so uh, particularly the vision. The vision, uh, I'm a big vision guy. And I think the vision is so biblical, it is so worthwhile, it is so rooted in what is pleasing to God. And so we unpacked that final part of the vision yesterday in two ways. We talked about, hey, glorifying God, that's not something we do. It's intrinsically wired to how we are. It's designed and created by God. And then in the evening, we talked about, and because we are designed that way, we are going to ultimately glorify what we deem to be worthy of it. And we said God's worthy of it. And so when we understand that, spiritually speaking, it should come as second nature for us. Now today, in the context of Sunday worship gathered as the body of Christ, I hope to kind of broaden the scope out more from the individual level and look at more corporately to see and ask the question of, well, what glorifies God in the context of his church, in the context of a body, right? Any, any Bible-believing, gospel-understanding Christian knows you fall short of explaining the gospel if it's just about Jesus saved me. Now, Jesus saved you, and he placed you into his body. Every Christian needs to mature to that understanding that when you become a Christian, it is a very corporate thing by definition and by nature. And so when it comes to the church and how Jesus feels about his church, one of the best places in Scripture to look at, in my opinion, in discerning that is actually in Revelation, the book of Revelation. There are seven letters that Jesus Christ, the head of his church, writes to seven churches in Revelation, Obviously, I don't want to just throw us in there. If you aren't familiar with the context of the seven letters in the book of Revelation, a very brief intro to that is that through the human author John, Jesus Christ, the head of his church, basically looks at the state of seven different churches, and he gives his assessment, right? So imagine Jesus entered into the doors today, and he comes into Good Stewards, and he's just observing, and he's concluding and evaluating, how's my church doing? And in these letters, he basically follows this format of things the church is doing well, the things the church is not doing not so well, and things the churches need to repent of and really work on and fix if they want to continue to be a church that is pleasing to God. It's a very sober thing to think about, and I'm hoping even after the message during discussion, you could really answer that question of, hey, if Jesus Christ, who is ultimately the shepherd of his church, right, uh, myself, Pastor Kay, we're just servants of the, servants of the Lord, uh, the ministry is run by and built by Christ himself. And so if you were to address and write a letter to your church, what would he say? And that's something I would hope you can keep in your mind as we look at this text in particular. And so obviously we're not going to go over all seven churches. That would be another retreat in itself. Uh, so I picked one of the churches, which is the fourth of the seventh churches, and is written to the church called Thyatira, the church of Thyatira. And just to be clear, I picked this church in particular because like the theme of this retreat, my hope is that by the end of the sermon, you can understand what one of the main aspects of a glorifying church is to God. And I'm going to argue that it's when the church values and pursues holiness, when the church values and pursues fighting sin as a body. And so if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to read verse 18 to 29. I'll read the text for us, and if you're okay, I'll pray for us, and we'll get into God's word together. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 29. It's the reading of God's word. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual morality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead." And all the churches will know that I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquered and who keeps my works until the end, 
To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with the rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. It's the reading of God's Word. Let me pray for us briefly. Father, we commit this time to you. We ask that you would ready our hearts and our ears to hear, not just words coming out of this mouth, but really words from your living and active word. I pray, Lord, that as individuals, but more specifically as a church, we would take heed to what your word has to say to us today, and that your spirit can really help it to take root into our hearts, and that it would make an influence and a transformative uh, impact into the way that uh, particularly Good Stewards lives out the vision that you've given to this church. And so, Lord, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you get to know me, you'll very quickly learn that one of my favorite things to do is uh, watch movies. Uh, in fact, I did not want to be a pastor. <laughs> my dad's a pastor. My brother's a pastor. My dad's brothers are pastors. My sister's a missionary. So I'm like, please no. <laughs> Anything but that. And here I am, I'm a pastor, right? But one of the things I wanted to do was actually I wanted to pursue media because I love media. I love movies. I worked shooting wedding videos at a time. I worked in YouTube for a little bit. And so I love movies. And one of my... Uh, Favorite actors, yeah, maybe you might agree, maybe you're not, is uh, this guy named Keanu Reeves, okay? He's a little bit old school. Maybe I dated myself. Thank you. I got one fan over here, right? And I've been a fan of him ever since this cult classic movie called The Matrix. I'm hoping at least a good number of you have either heard of it or seen it. And Matrix was one of those iconic movies of our generation for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, please watch it. I think it's worth watching. It kind of redefines sci-fi for the modern era. And there's a famous scene in The Matrix, even if you haven't watched it, you've probably heard of it or see it, where basically there's this guy named Morpheus, okay, track with me here, and Morpheus, he's this guy who he's understood that The Matrix is not a real world, it's just this fake program that people are living in, and he is this guy who like, sees things for what they really are, and so he goes to this character, Neo, and he presents him with two options, and he opens his palm in this iconic scene, and he says... Neo, you got a choice. There's a red pill, there's a blue pill. And kind of the, the implication is that each pill, depending on what he chooses, has a massive implication for what his life and his future will look like. There's pros and cons to each one. And so Morpheus basically says, you choose the blue pill, you go right back to the matrix. You're going to live in ignorance because you're basically choosing to not know reality, but it might be comfortable. You can go back to whatever you're doing. And you don't have to face hardship. You'll just go back. But the red pill, life's going to get harder. But your eyes are going to be open. You're going to see things for how they really are. You're going to wake up in the real world. You're going to see and much soberly understand. And so that's kind of the implication. And the implication is this. You can only pick one. It's either the red or the blue. And once you do it, there's no turning back. Now, that scene, it kind of tugs at our heartstrings because the idea that we can only pick one, when both paths seem to have benefits, is a very paralyzing conundrum, especially for our modern age and culture. You see, what we find that our society does is instead of picking one, don't we often try to do both? That's just how we are in our culture in today's age. I remember a funny story. Uh, I think we all love boba, right? Uh, my wife and I thoroughly enjoyed the tea pumps boba that she guys had. We were like shoving in our stroller, like it takes them home, right? So, so Korean of us, right? So boba, uh, w- one of the church members uh, at our church loves boba as well. So we went to a boba fellowship hangout. And there was a sister in my church where she came from the, the, uh, you know, the cashier, and she looked visibly frustrated, and she was holding two bobas. And I was like, why are you so angry? And she was angry because she has two flavors that she really likes, passion fruit and strawberry. And she was frustrated because the store owner would not mix the flavors for her. So she made this custom request, I'd like passion fruit strawberry. The owner's like, we don't do that. So you know what she ended up doing? She bought both. She put two straws in and drank from both straws. Literally. Who does that? It was quite an amazing thing to see. So she found a way (laughs) to basically have both because she's like, I don't want to pick one. I want to have both. Here's another example. Uh, I know there's a the Chinese Korean restaurant that a lot of people go here and roll in. Is it called New Garden? New Garden? 
Yeah, New Garden. We had one in Fullerton too. And that's basically where everyone goes after graduations because, you know, where are we going to go, right? So we just go there. And the funny thing about when you go there is the dilemma for me growing up was always at the end of the meal, they'll ask you, do you want black noodles or red noodles? You want jajangmyeon or champong? And that is a paralyzing conundrum for me. I love both. And you know what store owners did? They are smart. They know the human heart. They solved the problem for you and created something called jam jamyeon. What the heck is that? It's literally both. <laughs> they have a bowl cut in the middle and they give you a middle divider so you don't have to make the decision. You could literally enjoy both. You know what that is? You're bending the rules. It's a hybrid dish. You don't have to decide. You get both. All of this is today in today's text. The church of Thyatira had adopted a kind of drink out of both jam jam yon theology and doctrine and relationship with sin. That's what's going on. You see, some of the members of the church had embraced and fallen into a best of both worlds theology and lifestyle. And to put it simply, today's text shows us that Jesus, the head of his church, is not okay with that. He is not okay with the best of both worlds mentality in his church that is created and supposed to reflect his glory and his holiness. How do we know this? Look at the way Jesus introduces himself to the church. Now, if you didn't know this about the seven letters, it wasn't that just each church received their own letter. Commentators will tell you each church received all seven letters. So that's kind of how it worked. There'd be a courier who would take all seven letters and every church would read all seven letters. So that's kind of how it worked. And so imagine uh, headings matter a lot, don't they? Right? When you receive an email, or back in the day when you receive physical mail, the, uh, the way that the person introduces themselves kind of tells you the tone of the text. So imagine you got an email from Pastor K. And in the beginning, the headline, it said, From K, your loving brother. You're probably preparing for This is going to be a warm, heartfelt message. Brother K, who loves me. What if instead it said, From K, your co-laborer in the gospel. He's probably going to be like, he's probably going to ask me to serve, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's probably going to ask me to like volunteer or something like that. You just kind of know, right? He's definitely not trying to get boba, right? Or what if it says, Pastor K, your leader? I'm probably in trouble, <laughs> right? Like I probably did something wrong. So imagine, just like you're going to do today, the Church of Thyatari calls a members meeting, and the leaders are receive these seven letters, and they're reading these seven letters aloud. And again, this is the fourth church, so say they go in order, and these are, the other churches are fascinating. I encourage you to look them up. But if you don't know, Ephesus, Jesus introduces himself to the church of Ephesus. And he says, the words of him who holds the seven stars and walks among the golden lampstands. What a beautiful picture, right? So you're thinking, oh, wow, Jesus is he's writing us a letter, right? Or Smyrna, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. And if I can basically summarize, the other churches get relatively positive introduction from Jesus Christ. And so you're thinking, ah, it's our turn, Thyatira. What is he going to say? And your ears perk up, and here's what he says. To the church in Thyatira, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now let me tell you why that is not the friendliest or most exciting of introductions that Jesus could give. Number one, Son of God... This is the only time in the entire book of Revelation that Jesus addresses and pictures himself as the son of God to the church rather than the son of man. Son of God highlights his deity. You see, oftentimes Jesus likes to refer himself as a son of man because he wants to emphasize his sympathy. He wants to emphasize his compassion. He wants to emphasize that I am like you and that I became in the flesh. But here, he's saying son of God because Jesus wants him to know from the get-go, I'm coming to you as God and judge. The son of God. Secondly, he says his eyes are like a flame of fire. Now, this imagery highlights the all-seeing nature and judgment of Jesus toward his church. Okay? This is not a romantic fire. <laughs> it's not a romantic stare. It is one of condemnation. Fire often represents judgment and condemnation in Scripture. It reminds me of Hebrews 4.13 when it says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So Jesus is saying, I see everything. Everything. Eyes like the flame of fire. And third, his feet are like burnished bronze. Now, if you didn't know, bronze is always biblically symbolic of judgment. 
So there's a pattern here, and there's a theme going on in the way that he introduces himself, which is basically the language of his introduction emphasizes holiness and judgment, and is not the most friendly to open a letter. Now, why is Jesus so threatening <laughs> to his church? Why is his tone like that? Now, obviously, we can't go over the whole text because it's a long one, but I'm going to break it down in three ways why Jesus introduces himself in that way and in this tone. And if you're a note taker, the three ways we're going to look at is, number one, Jesus is addressing them in this manner and tone because, number one, they had developed a tolerant love. Number two, they had developed a tolerant doctrine. And number three, they had developed into a tolerant congregation. Okay, tolerant love, tolerant doctrine, tolerant congregation. So number one, what do I mean by tolerant love? I think you can make a strong case that the most popular and pervasive value of our modern Asian culture, if you could use it in one word, what would it be? I think it would be tolerance. Tolerance. Tolerance is an absolutely loaded word. People define it and interpret it in all kinds of different ways. But there is a general understanding by the vast majority of people that this word has been adopted and defined to basically mean tolerance equals you have to accept and embrace anything and everything regardless of whether you agree or disagree with it. That's what tolerance means in today's modern age, I would say. And what makes tolerance as defined by today's modern culture, because it wasn't always this way, but by today's modern culture, what makes tolerance so difficult is that the definition of tolerance today has become synonymous and equivalent with what it means to be a loving person. And I think we all agree, nobody wants to be known as an unloving person. Isn't that right? It's one thing for you to say, hey, I think you're pretty intolerant. I'm like, okay, well, hey, you're not a loving person. Ooh, that, that hurts a little bit more. And the, what modern culture has done is they've equated the two. They've super glued them together. And the narrative that is now blasted through almost every medium of our society today, whether it's social media, whether it's Instagram, whether it's movies, whether it's dramas, is that love, the purest form of love, is acceptance. Don't you hear that everywhere now? It's literally flooding and inundating everything that you see and hear. And therefore, what people will say is one of the most unloving things you could do, therefore, is to disprove of someone else's beliefs, someone else's worldview, and someone else's lifestyle. In the opening of Jesus' letter to the church in verse 19, he says, Thyatira, there's a lot of good things happening at the church, right? Like I mentioned, it wasn't all doom and gloom. He does mention when churches are doing some things well. And so the church of Thyatira they were actually very good at being loving, right? He says, you're full of love, you're full of faith, you're full of service and endurance. And unlike the church of Ephesus, which you guys might have heard, they're the ones that, hey, you forgot your first love. Unlike Ephesus, Thyatira seemed to be a growing church. They were booming. And in a similar, I think good stewards, you guys are growing, right? You have a lot more members than when I first came a long time ago. Seems like you're trying to build something great here. Seems like there's at least the appearance of very good things happening here. And so on the surface, Thyatira was booming. It was probably growing rapidly. And if you ask any newcomer, what did you feel from Thyatira and the service? People were feeling probably loved. They were probably feeling welcomed. And you even implies that they were doing really good things for God. And that's what the most notable commendation is. Thyatira, it's a very loving church. That's what Jesus is kind of commending in a way. That's what set them apart from other churches. But what we see is that in their pursuit of love, the Achilles heel, if you guys don't know what that is, basically the, the weakness or the danger that formed in this church was a conformity to and acceptance, therefore, of sin and immorality under the banner of love. Now, what might this tolerant love have looked like? Now, let me give you a little context to understand. Thyatira, it was a city, it was a blue-collar town. Okay, so it wasn't like a very uh, rich people place area. It was very blue-collar where literally everyone there was a member of a trade guild. And a guild is basically like a workers' union. And so blue-collar meaning there was like a coppersmith guild or a dyer guild where you dye clothing or a potter's guild or a weaver's guild. So everyone was a part of a guild or a union. And basically, in that context, if you wanted to hold a job, or run a business, it was absolutely mandatory and it was a no-brainer that you have to be part of a guild or a union. Guilds back then, they were part of the social and economic backbone of the city. Everyone was a part of one. Now, here was the problem for Christians, though. Every guild was religious in nature 
And a requirement for guild membership was attendance at guild banquets, which involved idol worship and sexual morality. That was just what happened back then. And so can you see kind of the dilemmas that Christian Thyatira would have faced, right? In one sense, they follow God, they worship and love God, but their social and their economic status and well-being, it almost depends on them tolerating things that God seems to disprove of and hate. Now, I know when we read Scripture, it's easy to pull away from it and judge them and be like, I would never fall, right? It's kind of one of those questions of like, hey, if your gun was pointing at you and they said, do you follow Jesus? Like, of course, you know, I'll die for the Lord. Well, let's see, you know, like when you get yourself in that situation. So I always like to almost say, oh, let's, before we're too quick to judge them, let's imagine that in today's context, okay? And so let me kind of paint the picture of what that might look like today. I think a lot of you are re- uh, recent grads, post grads, young adults, uh, and a lot of us are maybe going through a job search, maybe a job interview, maybe you want to get a new job. So imagine you're at a job interview. And it is the absolute perfect situation. They say it's, it's close to home. In fact, you don't even have to come into the office. Indefinite work from home if you want. No problem. Good pay. Great benefits. So you get through first, second round of interview. You get to the final round. And they're like, we're pretty much ready to give you a formal offer. And at the final stage of the process, your interview mentions, oh, by the way, though, if you want to work here, and if you want to be successful, you have to take part in our monthly company parties. And you hear through the grapevine, hey, these parties, they regularly take place during Sunday worship for some reason. A lot of the times, they involve drunkenness and sin. But everyone knows, in and outside the company, you have to participate if you want any real shot at being successful, any real shot at being promoted, or developing a positive social reputation in the company. What would you do? What do the Christians at Thyatira do? They developed a tolerant love for God and for one another. Their love for God became tolerant in that they tolerated and accepted things into their life that God clearly hates. And as a result of that, because they themselves were no longer walking in holiness, they also developed a tolerant love for other believers because now they no longer had the conviction or the witness and platform to say anything. Right? Because you know what the worst thing to do? Call someone out when you're doing the same exact thing. That's why when a pastor comes up here and says, hey, as a church, we need to pursue holiness. We need to be accountable for one another. We need to check each other when we're falling into sin. Isn't the worst time you feel like doing that when you're doing the same exact thing? That's what happened. The witness was totally ruined. Now, regarding tolerance, Pastor Kevin DeYoung, this is what he says. Quote, Christians cannot be tolerant of all things Because God is intolerant of all things. We can respect differing opinions and try to understand them, but we cannot give our unqualified, unconditional affirmation to every belief and behavior because God doesn't. We must love what God loves, and that's where the church of Ephesus failed, but we must also hate what God hates, and that's where the church of Thyatira failed. Did you know true love according to Scripture involves hatred. Here's what I mean by that. Romans 12, 9, it says, let love be genuine. What is genuine love? It says, abhor, the strongest word for hate, what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. In other words, if you really love, the other side of that coin is that you hate everything that will hurt what you love. Every parent who is a genuine parent is a hater. Why? Because you hate things that will hurt what you love. I hate bees. If they sting Ezra, they're going to really hurt him. I hate things that, you know, it's, it's really weird. Like a lot of babies, they have allergies. I love eggs, right? And I remember I fed egg to Ezra, and it looked, I don't even know if it's real, but it looked like he was like a mini allergic reaction. I want to like chuck that egg across the room. Like, I hate this egg, right? Why? Because I love Ezra. Love and hate have this intrinsic, almost symbiotic relationship where if you really love something or someone, you are also a passionate hater. I know it sounds weird, but that's what it says. A genuine love abhors what is evil. So the church in Thyatira's love for Jesus grew intolerant and accepting of immorality, sin, and compromise. Now, how did this happen? Does this just come out of nowhere? Where did this come from? Which leads to number two, a tolerant doctrine. 
If you look at verse 20, Jesus says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual morality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So according to the text, the root of the problem in the church was that this false teacher had infiltrated the church, and Jesus calls this teacher Jezebel. Okay? Now, most likely, her name was not really Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel was the name of a notorious evil person in the Old Testament. You might have heard of her before that introduced and encouraged idol worship and sexual morality to God's people. She was known for especially manipulating her husband Ahab, who was the king at the time. And she convinced him, hey, let's get into syncretistic worship. Let's mix it all together. It doesn't have to be just God. And so Jezebel basically is a symbolism and a name that became synonymous with evil and wickedness. So brothers... Don't date a Jezebel. <laughs> okay? Uh, fathers, don't name your daughter Jezebel. I, don't, I haven't met a Jezebel today, or I haven't met a Jezebel yet. If you know a Jezebel, like, don't tell her I said that, <laughs> okay? But generally speaking, Jezebel is not a good name, or it's not a proper name. So Jesus' issue was that the church of Thyatira had not only allowed this false teacher into their midst, but... A number of them were tolerating and almost even accepting this woman and her practices. Now again, before we judge the members of the church of Thyatira for allowing this to happen, let's actually consider what she was teaching. The text tells us the doctrine she had brought into the church involved seducing people to practice sexual morality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now this might sound like a ridiculous teaching, wouldn't it? Like could you imagine... Pastor K is like, Pastor Sam's going to give a message today. And I came and I was like, you know what you need to do? Here's your application. Go be sexually immoral and worship idols. You guys would be like, false teacher, right? Like, it's so obvious. So was that what was going on here? No. The word is a seduce. She seduced them. How might she have seduced them? Remember, in that society, sexual morality and idolatry were required for social and economic stability. So let me try to propose what she might have taught and said. So let's just say you're, del- you're in debate, and, you, and she comes to you, and she says, let me talk to you. What are you struggling with? And you're like, you know, there's this, there's this job, and I have to join this union. I feel like it might be compromising my faith. I don't know what to do. And, you know, he, she, here's something that Jezebel might have said. Well, don't you have to take care of your family? Isn't that important? Or don't you have to be a good steward of finances? Isn't that your church name, Good Steward? Or a guild meeting? Dude, what a mission opportunity. You're just being all things to all people. Plus, there's forgiveness and grace. There's always forgiveness and grace. Grace upon grace, right? Isn't grace magnified most in sin? So you're just getting more grace. Or missing your Sundays regularly? Everybody does that. At least you'll go more than that person in your church or that person It's the 21st century. Just listen to the podcast or just zoom in. Wouldn't you be enticed by such a teaching? It sounds a lot like the best of both worlds, doesn't it? So you're telling me I could still live calling myself a Christian, but I can also still get to participate in the pleasures and the practices of the world, and my social and economic life are untouched? Sounds a lot like best of both worlds. How was Jezebel able to teach and thrive in the church of God? You know why? Because the people were craving her teaching. That's why. One pastor says it like this, and I think it's very telling. He says, you know, theological problems, in the end of the day, are always usually moral problems in disguise. Theological problems are moral problems in disguise. In other words, he'll say, if you talk to someone, people rarely genuinely have theological and doctrinal issues. They have moral issues that they want resolved. And the reason Jezebel became accepted and popular wasn't because her teaching was biblical, obviously, but because her teaching fulfilled the sinful longing of the people while soothing their conscience. That's why. Now, what are some kind of examples of this tolerant doctrine that might be existing today? Anything that says stuff like, you can be a faithful Christian and be an unchecked sexual sin or unchecked pornography. You can be a faithful Christian, but still get drunk, no problem. You can be a faithful Christian apart from a meaningful gathering of God's people. Now, let's be honest. 
doesn't the flesh in you crave this kind of doctrine and teaching? Doesn't it? The notion that, so I get God in heaven. I'm not going to go to hell. But God never gets mad at us. We can do what we want with our bodies and our lives. And that there's always forgiveness, grace, and acceptance. Jezebel gained the following because what she did is she made Christianity a lot easier, a lot less costly, a lot less countercultural, a lot less like Jesus. And here's the problem. The spirit of Jezebel is very alive and kicking in every church today, including this one. If worldliness and unchecked sin is not only practiced, but again, accepted into the life of our church and our members, then you start to fall into the territory of Thyatira. David Wells, a famous quote regarding worldliness, he's like, you want want me to explain worldliness to you? This is what he says, and I quote, Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. It thus gives great plausibility to what is morally wrong, and for that reason makes what is wrong seem normal. You guys catch that? So he's saying worldliness is when you see God's standards, and it it doesn't seem like bad anymore for you to break it. Notice he doesn't say what makes wrong right. He's just saying what's wrong seem normal. Because isn't that all we kind of need? I don't have to know that it's right. I just need to know that it's not evil or wrong. Then I'm cool. Question, when is the last time that you said no to something because it's contrary to pursuing godliness and holiness in your life? You know, we live in an era of good vibes, right? I think the, the modern idol that we all worship is vibes. At my church, we have a basketball league. I know this more than anyone else. My team name was Jivo, good vibes only. <laughs> that was all, that's what we were about. You know, sometimes being set apart and pursuing holiness means you kill the vibes. You're a vibe killer. You're a party pooper. When parties get out of hand, you leave early. You decline something because it could be morally compromising. Jezebel was probably the queen of vibes. It was an attractive Christianity, and if you think about it in a certain light, it actually made a lot of sense because idolatry and sexual morality was the norm of the day. Everybody did it. That's just the way things were. It was the air that they breathed. But Jesus says it is a compromised Christianity. And do you know what Jesus calls it in the text? This brings fear to my bones because even though I study this and I see that, I don't think, like, is it really that bad? Right? It doesn't sound that bad. You know what Jesus calls it? He calls it a doctrine straight from the pit of hell. That's what he says. Not my words. He says, literally Jesus calls it the deep things of Satan. Now, isn't it ironic, though, that the most satanic doctrine looks, sounds, and smells so much like the gospel? You know why? It's because Scripture tells us that if Satan himself were to walk in this worship today, he would be the closest thing to Jesus. He disguises himself as an angel of light. And a lot of us who have a more cliche understanding of Satan, we think he's going to come in red pitchfork horns. You know, if he were to come in human form, he would look a lot like Pastor Sam and Pastor Kate. He'd probably be more theologically knowledgeable than both of us. That's how Satan works. And this kind of sin-tolerating, anti-law, obedience-dismissing, holiness-ignoring, grace-chipping doctrine in the church is why Jesus is so potentially judging of the church. Because Jesus, think about it this way. The church is not just some institution. He's not some CEO. The revelation of all books tells us Jesus doesn't play games because the church is his bride. It's his bride. There's a lot invested in his bride. And he literally says he's going to judge and punish Jezebel and all of her followers unless they repent. And now why does Jesus judge? He doesn't just mindlessly judge. It gets two reasons. Number one, he says, to punish them. He says, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. Church, one of the things that's not talked about is that Jesus has and has often potentially will bring judgment upon his own people, and that is a scary thing to think about. Jesus has literally killed people, and that is mind-blowingly fearful, isn't it? The church of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, they come in, Christians, supposedly, 
They lie about how much offering they give. Is that really a big deal? Strikes them dead. Because Jesus doesn't play games with the bride. And the second reason, he says, the reason I'm doing this is to let all the churches know that I'm not just an idle observer when it comes to the church. Why? Because I'm going to build my church, I'm going to protect my church, and I will even prune and judge my church if necessary, and so that all other churches, whether in that context or even today, in 2021, will know that I will give to you each according to your works. And so what we see is Jesus is angered by the church's tolerant love that grew from the foundation of tolerant unbiblical doctrine, which tells you doctrine matters. That's why I love that part of the vision intrinsically is the word of God. You're not here trying to be discipling and be a family and glorifying God by Pastor K's passions or Pastor K's opinions or the latest article that you're reading. No, it's by God's own word because doctrine matters. It affects how you view the world. It affects how you live your life. It affects how you view yourself. Doctrine is the anchor and the compass on which how you interpret all of life. So if the love became too tolerant and doctrine was tolerant, what was the third and final issue? These things led them to become a tolerant congregation. Who is Jesus writing the letter to? Think about that. Is he writing it to the pastor of the church of Thyatira? Is he writing it to the elders? Is he writing it to the leadership team? No. The letter is addressed to the entire church. And what is the primary indictment? It's not to Jezebel. He doesn't say, church of Thyatira, go give this letter to that false teacher Jezebel. I got some words for her. No. He doesn't even say to the, uh, to the followers. No. He's addressing it to Christian church, the Christian church. And he says, I have this against you, the church, that you are tolerating that woman, Jezebel. Jesus' issue is not with Jezebel. It's not with the non-Christians. It's with his body. So in today's context, it's with the members of Good Stewards. That's who he's addressing to. He's rebuking the congregation. Why? Because they clearly saw that Jezebel was negatively influencing and affecting the body, but they did nothing about it. In fact, some of them saw nothing wrong with what was happening. Church, make no mistake, if the church is the body of Christ, please catch this analogy, then the members are the immune system of that body. An immune system that does not remain vigilant against sin is like a body that is defenseless against disease. And just like a physical body will eventually die without an immune system, the church will also spiritually die without the accountability of its members. That's why it blows my mind, but the scariest diseases are not the diseases in themselves. They are the diseases that get rid of the immune system. Did you know we catch diseases all every day? We get sick all the time. We're just not aware because our immune systems are active and working. But wait till we get a little older our immune system goes down, you get sick a lot more, not because you weren't getting sick before, but because your defenses are gone. That's why Paul in Ephesians 4.15 says, the ultimate mark of a growing, healthy church, okay, it's not the building size or how gifted the people are or how beautiful the praise is. Paul says, the way that the body of Christ is built up is when members are speaking truth in love to one another. That's what he says. So good stewards, as you're like, how do we gauge growth in our church? It's not, oh, we went from 50 members to 70, 90. Obviously, that's encouraging and good. It's not, wow, our worship is so powerful and impactful, as great as that is. It's, are the members speaking truth and love to one another? And both are critical. Satan will have no problem if you only speak truth. Satan has no problem if you only love. You need both. I like the illustration one pastor gives. I'm going to get a little nerdy here, okay? For all the biology fans, maybe you guys like this. But he basically taught, I didn't know this. This was mind-blowing to me, right? If you didn't know, sodium and chloride, these elements, by themselves, they're poisonous. Sodium is this metal where if you add it to water, it explodes. Chlorine by itself, if you do anything with it, it's a highly poisonous gas. So in other words, if you ingest sodium or chloride alone, you die. But if you put them together properly, it becomes sodium chloride, which you know what that is? Table salt. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So too, doctrine and love must be found together. One without the other can lead to a dangerous imbalance. But combined, they provide flavor and health to the body of Christ. Church of Ephesus, they had strong doctrine, but they lacked love. Church in Thyatira, they were strong in love, 
but they lacked doctrine. They weren't willing to disagree with or confront anyone about sin. Now, obviously, I don't know the context of the membership here. Hope that it's good. I hope this question is easy to answer. When's the last time that you lovingly but firmly exposed sin in a fellow brother or sister? You know, we live in an era that has watered down the language and definition of sin because we don't want to be offensive. And so instead, you know what we do? Instead of calling sin for what it is according to Scripture, which is, hey, this is, I think you're rebelling against God. Or, hey, I think the Bible seems to say it's like spiritual adultery. Or, hey, I think you're breaking God's clear commands. You know what we do instead? You go in a small group and we say things like, what are you struggling with? Or, or any hardships you're going through recently? Not to say those are bad things, but it's watered down. So to make an extreme, I'll go the other way. Church, unrepentant drunkenness is not a struggle. It's a sin. <laughs> Sexual morality, unrepentant, habitual watching of pornography, lust, it's not a struggle or a hardship. It's a sin. And notice the key word here is unrepentant. It means not that I'm wrestling with it as a believer, but unrepentance means it has become normalized in your life. It's no longer an issue. It's part of your weekly routine. It's not even those explicit things. It could be unrepentant, unchecked bitterness or slander or hatred of others. That is not a struggle. That is sin. And Jesus says there's only one thing that we need to do when it comes to sin. Don't rationalize. Don't justify. Repent. That's what he says. Repent of your sins. Don't try to water it down. Don't try to explain away why it's okay. Don't compare, well, that person is so much worse than me. No, 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 no. Repent. You know, I had a chance to talk to some of the members yesterday and just know uh, my brother Daniel Shim and I, we envy this church. You guys have a beautiful patio over there. (laughs) You guys have a nice gym, right? We're renting a school. When we go out to fellowship, we don't have a nice shaded thing. It's literally just sunlight, right? So it's funny because we meet in a school theater and when we come out, it's like people coming out of a movie theater. Everyone's like, oh, like blinded, right? It's like salvation every every week, right? Like, oh my gosh, the blinding light of Christ. So it's exciting. I think, and this church has grown, right? Uh, You guys are regathering, you're rebuilding. How encouraging it is that when you say, hey, we're going to meet in prison for Bible study, you guys are clapping. That would not happen at our church, right? People would be like, cool, right? But you guys are like, oh, yeah, meeting in person, amazing, right? So you're, there's exciting, there's newcomers coming, there's new building projects. But let me tell you this, church, don't make the mistake of thinking external movement and mo- momentum, therefore excuses the tolerance of internal sin and teaching. That's what Thyatira did. Booming! God is moving. Let's keep the momentum and maybe compromise here and there. You see, despite Jesus' rebuke, though, in every true church, he encourages some in the church, if you are not falling and if you're not teaching and you're getting discouraged because it seems so rough around you and everyone seems to be falling, he says, hold fast. Don't give up. Don't give up. He commends them and says, hold fast. And so those of you who are just faithful, you know who you are. God knows who you are. Those of you that just grind, Those of you who put in those unseen hours to build the church and you're sacrificing in a way that nobody even knows. It reminds me of a sister that I knew when I used to do college ministry. She would come every Friday a little bit more tired than the average and people would judge her. And I had nothing but compassion for her because little did they know she was driving two hours every Friday where other people were driving 10 minutes. Why? Because she saw it as valuable and worthy to come and serve the church. And I tell her, hey, those people might not know, but the more I know, But more importantly, Christ knows. Hold fast. I see it's worth it. So especially in a season of transition and rebuilding, we must know our love must be grounded in holiness and truth. Now as I close, if nothing else, this text reminds us that Christianity and faithfulness to Jesus, then therefore it comes at a cost. Isn't that an obvious application? There is a price to be paid to be a Christian. The price might be a loss of popularity, a loss of acceptance, a loss of status, a loss of money, a loss of power. Now, just imagine how some of the faithful Christians at Thyatira might have been feeling. Think about some, maybe some of the fathers. Fathers were probably struggling because their association with Jesus got them fired. So they don't know how to provide for their family now. 
I would not know what I would do in that situation if my job was on the line because if I follow Jesus, I can't feed Ezra. That is a terrifying situation to be in. Or Christian homes were probably being socially isolated and ostracized because they're not within the communal life of the guilds. And in today's world, like I said, the greatest social sin you could commit is being a vibe killer, right? Nobody wants to hang out with a party pooper or a vibe killer. And I struggle with this greatly because, like I mentioned, I'm not one of those guys that became a pastor because I could not see myself doing anything else, right? Whenever those, like, old school pastors would say, you know why I became a pastor? I could literally not see myself doing anything else. That doesn't speak to me. I'm like, I could see myself doing so many things. In fact, dude, pastors, I don't know if you guys know, it's like you get full time and that's it. (laughs) There's no promotions. There's no raises. I'm not in this for the money. And sometimes I get tempted because I see peers buying houses, advancing in their life, in their career. Whereas in the church, there ain't no promotions. You know what there are? There's just more frustrations. There's just more people struggling with sin. And I wonder sometimes if I picked a different career, I might be happier. I might make more money. So just not pastors. We're not immune to these kind of temptations. But as you struggle with that, to those who remain faithful, Jesus gives a promise and a hope. He holds fast to two things he says. Number one, if you hold fast, I will give you authority over the nations. Really quick, what does that mean? He says, you may be opposed, marginalized, ridiculed, persecuted, lowly and poor as a result of following me in this life. But he says, when I come, you will reign with me in glory. That's what he's saying. I will give you authority over the nations. You will share in my reign and kingship. I will exalt you. In fact, those who are most lowly and humbled in this life as a result of following me, you are the ones that I will exalt and pick up, and you will be victorious in the end. So hold fast. Now, as I say that, maybe for some of us, that's not appealing or exciting to you. And here's why. It's probably because... There is literally no cost in your life to following Jesus. Those of you who are paying a cost to pick up your cross, that should bless your soul. You know what you're doing? Because you're making kingdom deposits. How sad would it be is if the deposit of the kingdom is the the payment of your sacrifice for Christ, and when you come to the kingdom, there's nothing to withdraw. If you have a compromised Christianity that freely drinks from both the world and the church, you don't stick out in any way, and you're not opposed to any idea, then this idea of the final glory and vindication is not exciting to you. That's why. But for the faithful ones who have counted, this is a precious promise. And secondly, he says, and the morning star. He promises not wealth, not material goods, not prosperity. You know what the morning star is? The morning star is Jesus himself. Jesus says, you follow me, if you overcome, your reward is me. You may not get what you want in this life, especially if you choose to follow me, but he says, you will get me. And the good news is that on that day, when our faith becomes sight and our hope becomes fruition, we will come to realize that Jesus was more than enough. That's why songs that sing like that, it always brings tears to my eyes when it says, you know, when we've arrived on that day, Weary, beaten, torn down from trying to live for Christ. It says, when your eyes of faith are no longer faith, but they become sight, no Christian will say, that's it. Every Christian will say, I would live this life a thousand times over to have this moment to experience Christ. And most importantly, when it comes to a cost, consider the cost and the price that Jesus paid to have you, to win you, to love and forgive you, to shed his blood, to be ridiculed, to be mocked, to be beaten, to be crucified by you in order to adopt you. And so Jesus writes these letters because he is a holy, passionate, and jealous bridegroom when it comes to the brightest church. And why? Because he paid the ultimate cost to purchase and make her his own. So quick application. If you've become tolerant of sins or things that hurt Jesus and clearly displease God, Can I call you just to repent and turn to him? The beauty of the gospel is that he is gracious. He is always willing infinitely over time to give time for repentance and experience so long as you will take it. And I guess a final word of exhortation to close out this retreat because it is still a retreat. I address the church because glorifying God, it is a group project. It's a group project. I would even say, church, you're only going to go as far as accomplishing your vision 
as maybe your, your most struggling member. That's the mentality you should have. Why? Because rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. That's what a body is. And so if I could put it this way, the pursuit of God's glory and the vision of this church, it is a group project. It is a corporate commission that Jesus gives to his church. So my prayer is that unlike Thyatira and their struggles, this would be a church that glorifies God individually, understands that God is glorious, but corporately as a church, that you understand one of the things that reflects his glory most accurately is when you're pursuing holiness together as Christians. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you carry enough through your inspired word to speak not only to your church then, but to your church now. I thank you for the ministry and the blessing of good stewards. Pray, Lord, that you can continue to be present in this church, that Jesus, you would be a head that is actively working and moving through your spirit, through the preaching of your word, through the gathering of your saints. Wherever we are doing spiritually, God, I know that your word always has something relevant to say if we would listen and hear. So, Father, for those of us where maybe repentance might be in order, pray, Lord, that that would be what's convicting us. For those of us who are maybe discouraging and feeling a little burnt out, remind us of the promise and the hope that we have in Christ. And for all of us, help us to see, God, that glorifying you is best done and most effectively done, not just by ourselves, but with fellow body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we thank Pastor Sam for that message? Let's give him a round of applause. I think it's a, a much uh, needed and a welcome message for our church. And uh, this is something that we've been doing throughout the retreat, but I want to give us a chance to reflect on that and to just bow our heads and come before God in prayer. And um, you can have your sermon notes open and your Bibles open as well and your eyes open as you pray. But as we reflect on why Jesus addressed the church in this way, remembering that they had to develop a tolerant love and a tolerant doctrine and a tolerant congregation. Can we take time to wrestle with God and ourselves and letting God's light shine upon our hearts and expose our sins? And we can do that because God is a God of grace. He's there to welcome us again. He's there to forgive us once again. And so let's bring ourselves to God in repentance. Take time to be honest with yourself, to be honest with God. I want to give us this morning to come to God in that way. And we'll pray for one more thing after that. So at this time, let's, let's come together as a church in prayer. And uh, let's bring our sins before God. Again, we can do that because God will forgive our sins when we confess. Let's go to him in prayer. I want to ask us to pray for just, just for one more thing here. Um, can we pray for one another? Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for our congregation. And maybe this is something that we don't do quite uh, often enough. Uh, but as we remember uh, that glorifying God is a group project and a, and a corporate commission, let's come before God and, and commit our church to the Lord. Some of us feel judged by one another for whatever reason it is whether it's on social media or an interaction here in person, some of us do feel judged. If that's you, could you take some time to pray for our church, that our church would be 
a church that loves and welcomes in the grace of God. On the flip side, if you are doing the judging, because <laughs> I think it's a two-way street, if you are doing the judging, if you have been doing the judging, could you bring yourself to repentance to God once again? Let's pray for the brother next to us. Let's pray for the sister next to us. And let's pray for our church that together as one body, we would glorify God. We'll pray for that. And we'll close in a final song of worship. Let's pray for our church together this time. Let's all stand as we sing this last song in response.
Father, we, we pray that together, that you would glorify yourself through us and our church. This morning, we take time to repent before you, but we repent confidently because we know that your grace is upon us in Christ. And we pray, God, that our repentance would grow in fruition to love and a holy love for one another. It would bear fruit in our conversations, in our lives, in how we work, in how we study, in all that we do, in our thoughts and our deeds. And so we pray that as we offer you our lives once again this morning, that your glory, your beauty, your gospel would be made known in this world through us, through your church. And we pray this confidently because we know that the Spirit is at work. We have full confidence that the Spirit of God will accomplish His purposes. And so we pray with confidence. And and God, we praise you for the word that was spoken. We thank you for this weekend that we got to spend together. We thank you for Pastor Sam and his ministry. And we pray that even as we walk out these doors today, in just a couple of minutes, may our hearts be filled with praises to you, God. And so we commit our church to you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Um, yeah, we, I guess we could give it up to the Lord as a clap offering, yeah. That officially...